We have built the world's largest decentralized data index of the internet. It's one of the largest in the world, only behind Google being Yandex and, and Baidu. Uh, we've built that through the development of a deepened network. There have been more businesses who tried to build a search engine. A lot of them have failed because of the centralized approach. We have our, our own generative AI called Wilson. Because we have our own index, we're going to be able to build that um, AI so that it's updated more frequently with fresh information from our index, a lot faster than um, chat GPT, for example. No one has ever tried it in such a decentralized fashion, completely distributed around the world. And the funny part is, it's actually working. How do you, within your company, regulate the data flow to other people? I mean, if you want the firehouse, you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we do not restrict it uh, in that matter. If you look into all the competitors that are centralized, they not only have a biased approach in their index, they actually change what you are looking for to something that they want you to look at. I would say we are uh, more resilient because we have more utility that is not just crypto bound or crypto related. Welcome to the Andy and Friends podcast. I'm your friend Andy. And today on the podcast, I'm talking to the two CEOs of Tempe, Gareth and Jurg. Tempe is building the world's largest web data index. And in this episode, we talk about what a data index even is why they chose to build theirs utilizing Web3 and DPIN with their nodes, what they are doing with AI and how they differentiate themselves there and so much more. I'm a huge fan of Tempe and what they are building and given that the data space is already valued at $500 billion and soon to be a trillion dollars plus in the coming years, I think paying attention here is a massive opportunity. So let's jump in. And here we are in this episode of the podcast with Gareth and Jurg from Tempe. Good to see you both. How are you doing? Good. Thanks good for having you, us. Man. Yeah, good to be here. Of, of course. Uh, so a lot of people um, you know, who watch my channel uh, and probably who watch the podcast know I am a massive fan of Tempe, of uh, which you're both the co-CEO of. Uh, but for those who don't know what Tempe is, and maybe Gareth, if you want to start and you're, you can you can pick up after, uh, what's the elevator pitch? What is Tempe? Like, give us the high line for those who are not in the know. Yeah, sure. So Tempe is first and foremost a data company, and we have built the world's largest decentralized data index of the internet. Now, this isn't just the the largest decentralized uh, data set, uh, but in its own right, it's one of the largest in the world, um, only behind uh, four others in the market. And um, they are Google being Yandex and, and Baidu. So um, behind those search engines that you know, behind Google and Bing, they have a uh, data set that you are searching, and that is effectively the index, and and that that is what we've built. Now we uh, we've built that through the development of a deepin network, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. And we utilize this data for products and services such as the search engine um, and uh, offering the ability for people to directly access that data for development research purposes, AI training, for example. And uh, what's unique about our data set is it's, a, it's addressing one of the key challenges that they, we have in the data industry, uh, namely the uh, abuse and the manipulation of uh, data from big tech. So uh, big tech manipulate that data um, uh, but that they are providing to users and they're manipulating the data that you search on search engines. And they also prohibit the, the use and how you can actually access that data as well. So we're opening all of that up uh, with our decentralized data index that we've built. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And Jurg, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think he, he described it very well. He can be, he, he's, he's better uh, than me in that. <laughs> and, the, you know, um, 90 seconds. <laughs> love it. Well, uh, how about this? I would love to then get some context for uh, who the two of you are. So like I, I already said, co-CEOs of Tempe, but what does that mean? And Jurg, we'll start with you. Like wh what is like, what's your half of the CEO job? Uh, what do you bring to the table? What are you both doing, you know, at Tempe on a, on a regular basis? 
Yeah, so I I think my my role is more the technology role. So I'm more in um, developing or you know managing or leading the development um, of our solutions. Um, I was the one who basically had the idea of having a decentralized um, search engine, and we're coming to that um, later on why. But my part is more the um, technology role, and um, Garris is filling the other half of um, running the business basically and you know doing more of the business development um and i think that's a really great uh, teamwork what, what, what that we have because i mean you know quite often you only have one ceo but you can't be good at everything so what we did was basically splitting to make sure that we are um, performing in our best capacity in the best area. And my best area is just technology. And um, Gary's best area or best, yeah, um, is the um, business development part. So that's why we really work quite well together for a long time now. Yeah. yeah. How long exactly? I mean, Timby alone is nearly three years now. Um, and we have been working together before that as well, so it's been quite some time. I think we we crossed paths uh, maybe six years ago, six seven years ago, working on project together. Um, well, it must be seven now. Seven yeah. years ago, yeah. Um, and then yeah, one day out of the blue, you came to me with this crazy idea of a decentralized data index. And here we all are together That's on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Okay. And then let's give some even more context here. I want to talk a little bit going back into that history. Like what are your professional backgrounds? Um, now Gareth, uh, maybe you can start and then, uh, and then your take, take over. Cause I know that there's some, there's some overlap there between the two of you, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. So my my backgrounds in uh, or my professional career before I got into sort of Timpy is implementation of ERP systems. That's enterprise resource planning. Uh, not particularly exciting, but what was really good about uh, having that experience in my professional career is it it really gives you a, a, a a deep understanding of how an organization works and it's really about understanding business objectives and then how can you overlay technology to fulfill those objectives so um specialize in erp implementation for five six seven eight years maybe quite a while um started that journey um with hewlett packard where i joined a, a, under a graduate program actually um and then was very fortunate to work within their consultancy arm and really uh, got, it was like a baptism of, of fire into the IT consultancy industry, uh, working off the bat, straight off the bat with some very large organizations such as Shell Oil, Vodafone, Philips, uh, among others. Um, then continued my journey, uh, still in the ERP space, working as an independent contractor, and that was where, as I said, I met Jörg uh, during that period uh, where we worked on a, on a project together. And then, um, yeah, three, three years later, uh, that's, uh, that's where the, the Timpy journey began. So my, my background is in ERP systems and IT consultancy. And Jörg, okay. what about you? Uh, I think I'm 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 older, so I'm going further back. <laughs> but my background is um, information security, so I have been um, helping businesses implementing information um, security management systems. Um, sounds boring, but it's not. <laughs> it's basic. You know, um, I started very early, um, and back when I started, there were no frameworks, there were no you know regulations around that. So I was basically working on those regulations with the German government, was creating um, the baseline manual for Germany, but then also went into ISO 27001, which is an information security framework where I contributed to and um, helped to shape how businesses can efficiently implement a um, security management system. So I did that for many, many years. Came to New Zealand 15 years ago, um, or nearly 15 years ago, and um, was then more, or cybersecurity came more along, right? So um, when I came to New Zealand, cybersecurity wasn't really there yet, 
but um, it it yeah it became more present and uh, the biggest challenge on on uh, in, in area cybersecurity is actually that businesses can't really measure or determine the likelihood of an attack so that was one of the biggest challenges as a consultant um, especially when you come from information security you are used to be able to tell the customer okay this event might be very likely or might be very unlikely so if you you know if you think of a simple thing like flooding in your server room let's go back a little bit flooding in your server room if, you, if your server room is not close to a river it might be relatively unlikely so it's easy to do in cybersecurity it's not that forward and it's not that easy to do and that was one of the reasons why um, I found that back in 2015 I started working on a cyber intelligence business called Darkscope and that helps businesses to understand their exposure in cyberspace and for that I think we will talk about it a little bit but for that I had to create a, a dark web search engine um, and that sparked my idea of would it not be great to have an alternative to the search engines we have today so to have access to data that is not owned by you know by the big players um, but that was you know at that point in time I was concentrating on the dark scope part and but it was the idea of okay I will pick that up at some point so a couple of years down the line, um, you know, Darkscope has been established and um, has been one of the leading um, cyber intelligence businesses in the world. And I thought, no, it's a good time to, um, you know, talk to someone to pick up the idea of having um, an alternative. And that when I start talking to Gareth, basically. So my background was always security, but through the security, I went into AI and into um, search algorithms and search engines because it was necessary at that point. Sounds like the entry into cybersecurity and everything, because it was, you know, like you said, it was kind of bleeding edge at the time. It wasn't really mainstream. Uh, there seems to be some certain parallels there between like Web3 and crypto. It's like it's still not mainstream yet. And yet here y'all are on the forefront of, because I mean, Deepin was not a thing a couple a couple of, I mean it, it was but the word was you know, the acronym was not thrown around this is yeah. an emerging idea you know having people build these infrastructure networks for the company and then getting incentivized to do so um so it seems like uh, you both have a knack for getting on to the kind of bleeding edge of things now was the uh, the dark web search engine was this the first one ever made um it's probably not the first one that was ever made um, but um, the alternatives at that point and still today are very limited. So uh, you have a few players that sell their dark web data um, for, for businesses to search in. I didn't like the idea of being dependent. So that was why I decided to create my own dark web search engine or that we develop our own search engine. It makes you a lot more flexible. It makes you um, also um, sleep better at night when it comes to, okay, I know what the dark web search engine does. I know how many pages it it uh, it actually collects. So I can talk to customers um, um, on that front um, with, with the knowledge that what it is we have is really great. So... Yeah, it, um, it was an interesting journey, <laughs> but it was my first search engine that I've built, yes. Yeah, okay, so there's even more parallels that, there because, Tim, I mean, the big idea of Tempe is you want to build this data company where you're going to have an alternative to the big four who are creating yeah. this web index. And it sounds like that's one of the kind of the impetus behind uh, doing the dark web search engine was you didn't like that there wasn't an alternative. So that's kind of cool to hear. Uh, okay, so before we get more into Tempe, I am curious with both of you, and Gareth, we can start with you. Uh, so Tempe is Web3, Tempe is D-Pin, you're building in this crypto space, which is an emerging market. When did you first get into the world of crypto, or like what was your entry point into crypto? Like what 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 gave you some interest in all, into all this stuff? Yeah, so actually, I, I think my, so my, my first entry into crypto was through a, a token called coin and that they're, they're uh, uh they're still an established business over in australia and, and and new zealand um and what they were focused on is um providing utility where people can trade value across their services so people would register and um yeah perhaps 
people who offer uh, run a hotel and um you know they'll say they have extra capacity and then you know they could swap it through tokenizations um with someone who's got extra stock in some wine somewhere i don't know so it says trading um and actually at the time when i when i looked in there i was doing it through a um, just some networking i didn't even realize it was blockchain didn't know it was crypto didn't know anything about it uh, but i got involved and then then understood what was actually happening and um, how they were utilizing the, that blockchain technology found that interesting then that kind of led me into uh the uh the, the crypto space um and then like most other people started trading learning how to trade how to what a wallet was and how to connect a wallet up to an exchange and uh that that was uh during the the bull run four years ago and um really at that point i was you know doing dgen trading uh going on to poo coin i think it was and uh looking at what the latest uh token release was going to be because they used to list what's what's about to launch and at that time you could just buy it and you know you had a a, a a 50 percent chance whether you were gonna you know lose anything or or, or make a, a 10x you know um but actually it's probably more than 50 percent actually you're like at that time where everyone was just getting getting into it you could you know and you could buy anything and it would go up as long as you got out before it crashed um they all temporarily <laughs> felt like geniuses yeah yes exactly <laughs> um so that was a lot of fun that was a lot of fun um and then I started uh, with some of the, 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 the tokens I was trading in, joined that community, did some mod work, did some other pieces of work for, for projects that I had invested in. And that's really how I uh, got into it, um, just gradually learning more and more about, about, about the industry um, uh, until the point where Timby came along, where you realize you don't know anything um about about uh, about it and um then obviously it's been a, a big journey and um really understanding how the technology and the industry works um which you don't really get unless you're running a, a big project like black tempe oh yeah i'm sure yeah i'm sure like just like going down the rabbit hole and learning and kind of playing around with stuff is its own giant journey. You had to like just baby step your way through because it's just kind of overwhelming. But I imagine building in the space is a whole different set of learning yeah. uh, instructions. Uh, so what about you, uh, Jurg? How did you get started in this space? Yeah, so I um, I was into or I'm I'm you know I have um, learned, heard, and and worked with a blockchain uh, for for quite some time. Uh, but I never went into crypto. Um, so my my first contact with actual crypto and creating my first wallet was with Timpy. So um, it was very interesting and a very steep learning curve, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, it was also very, very interesting. So now I, uh, I didn't I didn't work in the crypto space. I mean, of course, you know, everyone heard about it, especially if you are in a technology industry, you always hear about it. and I heard about uh, um, you know, Bitcoin very, very early on, and people told me that I should buy in and stuff like that. Well, I didn't. Um, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just for me at that point in time. So I had to, I had a lot of interest in in blockchain. So that's you know it's um, that's that's a very interesting topic when it also comes to um, information security or security in, in general. So blockchain itself is a very interesting topic, but it wasn't really for me um, going into the crypto space that actually came with Timpy. So at this at this stage, uh, is it still just kind of a an interesting technology that you're exploring and you see you know as a great way to launch Timpy? Um, is that all it is, or do you actually have you gone down the rabbit hole at all yourself do you own any bitcoin have you invested anywhere or is it purely the technology side purely thing also i haven't i haven't uh, bought any any crypto um currency at all i was completely nervous on at that at that point so no uh, it was really the technology that that uh, sparked my interest and um when we were planning or started planning on, on the timby side how do we want to do it it was just the logic step to go that in into that direction um because it has a lot of benefits so yeah but it um yeah it was for me it was just completely new 
Okay, you're all in on Tempe. I love it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that last thing you just said is interesting, and I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but I think this is maybe a good place to talk about it. Uh, talk to me, Jurg, about some of those benefits. Like, there's, you know, in this day and age, you can build a business in Web two still, right? And there's this new Web three emergence where you know everybody is, it's all the hype. Uh, I see a lot of legitimate merits in going this route, but I'm curious, like before y'all started Tempe, why why were you drawn uh, to this this path? Web three. Yeah, so you have the choice when you do any business, whatever you want to do. Um, you have the choice between doing it yourself, and that would be the web two approach. So need you need to you know organize all the infrastructure. You need to make sure that you have everything. Um, if you would want to work with someone, you need to basically have a completely payment structure around it, which you know today I would say was fiat and so on. It gets very complicated. Um, especially if you have an international business. So um, from a technology point of view, it was really the right choice to go on to Web3 because it gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you, um, it can give you trust in an untrusted um, environment through the blockchain. So, and that's a very important part um, and that enables you to do things like we do on an international level where we don't now... Um, the uh, contributors, for example, we don't know them personally, obviously, but there are things that can put in place on the blockchain that allows us to have a trusted relationship without even knowing them. And that's that's some of the benefits that we see and that we saw at that point, And that's why we um, decided to go that way. Yep. Any thoughts here, Gareth? Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> yeah, if we look at the the, the start of the journey, just getting into this industry is, is, a, is a huge cost. And that's one of the things that uh, blockchain technology can um, solve. Uh, if you look at Bing, for example, um, to which it, our, our index size is, is coming on to being co comparable with that now, um, they took a, a decade and hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to build that index up. And you know, would have started with a capital of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we we started off with virtually nothing, um, with a very s s small um, amount of capital, uh, but we had time and, and knowledge and dedication. And by then utilizing blockchain technology, it enables us to um, you know utilize that 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 community that um, build that network up to. Uh, scale to the same size as centralized competitors, but um, at a much cost-effective, uh, in a much cost-effective way. Yeah, I imagine uh, even the the route you're taking, uh, building an index, a web index as big as Bing or any of the other big players, is already enough of a massive task. Uh, if you were to not have this network to lean on, you had to build all your own infrastructure and do it the old fashioned way, you know, quote unquote, uh, that would be an extraordinarily big task. And for a lot of, you know, a lot of upstarts and stuff, and I imagine close to impossible task. And is that, I mean, I, I guess, is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Um, there have been more, you know, there um, there, ha there have been more um, um, businesses who tried to build a search engine. Uh, or a data index, a web index, and um, a lot of them have failed because of the centralized approach. Um, and that was from the beginning, um, we knew that that's not the right way to go. So, um, and yeah, it, it turned out to be, um, it was the right, you know, the right step. And as of right now, I know uh, like me talking about Tempe, I've been covering it a lot, especially with the latest uh, node launch and stuff. That this uh, this thing, this this goal in the in in the in the distance is getting as at least as big as Bing in terms of overall index, and you know, uh, obviously like surpassing that one day and stuff. Like, how close uh, is Tempe right now to having a data index the same size as Bing? Oh, we are not that far off. <laughs> I mean, as you know, when we did our um, collector test network, we did uh, a little bit about um, 3 billion uh, pages in a week or something like that. So uh, Bing's index is 
estimated around seven and a half to 10 billion pages. That's the index size. There is only an estimation. So no one knows it exactly because they don't publish the numbers. It's the same with Google. Um, but if we look into that index size of, let's say, 10 billion pages, and uh, we are doing about 3 billion per week, then obviously we have to go back to pages. You know, we have to refresh it and stuff like that. But um, I, you know, with with our um, um, current um, Guardian Network um, um, Apex event, we are now have the capacity to surpass that for sure. And um, I mean, you know, at the moment when we look into our plans, early next year, um, probably um, end of first quarter, somewhere around that line, we should be um, sustainably exceeded the size of Bing's index. That's for sure. And I'm I'm very, you know, um, careful about my words because it's really not it's not about reaching um, ten billion, because reaching ten billion when we do three billion per week, well, that's three weeks, <laughs> so um, that's not true, and that would be silly to to say, ah, yeah, well, in three weeks time we have Bing, and in I don't know twelve weeks time we we surpass uh, Google, that's not going to happen, and it's not the, it's not what we measure. What we measure is not only the size, but also, also the freshness. So we need to make sure, yes, of course, we can put in uh, pages and these might then be months, months old. We don't want that. So our aim have uh, our aim is to have a fresh a fresh rate for, um, of 48 hours across all web pages. So some of them will be on a minute base. Some of them we might only come back once a week. So obviously our algorithm works in a way that it rates um, the freshness of pages so we compare um when we go back we compare has something changed and if not then it gets a lower value in terms of freshness and then we go back later and later um once we hit the i think once a week um we go at least once a week uh, to a web page but that's when we say across the board we want to have 48 hours freshness rate and that's where we talking about hundreds of billions of pages per month so that's why I'm saying um, I'm conservative and talking about end of first quarter next year. <laughs> we also need to put that into to context with like the types of data we're collecting as well. So when we're talking about uh, you know, three million domains, it's the domain uh, information and like the the um, you know the, the the text data within that. But there's other media types as well in all this. So there's images and, and, and videos and music. All, and all kinds of different files. And so, you know, as we're building our index at the moment, we're focusing on that um, uh, the domain and text space information. And then we're uh, starting now to move into collecting all the other types of information as, as, as well, the images and videos and music and uh, files, you know. Um, and then that's when not only will be comparable in size of being in terms of uh, like the D core domain indexing, um, which we're pretty close to already now. But once we've got all that other media indexed, um, that's where we have the data um, uh, and all the different data types and media types to be able to be comparable to being from an end user perspective, right? So if we look at you know the search engine, then you're not just searching the the, the text and the raw data. Yeah, it's it's images and videos and, and all those other things. So that's when we talk about the 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 Q1 of 2025. Yeah, and then is there an is there an industry standard um, across some of the big players when it comes to freshness of updates of pages because you know, in my mind, it's like, you know, 48 hours for, you know, uh, on average or something seems pretty cool if you were going to build like a, a GPT or something using your data set. And it's not once a quarter updated, it's every couple days updated. That sounds amazing to me. Like, what is the current standard and why do you choose 48 hours? There's no standard. Um, so everyone is basically keeping their information very close to their chest. Which means we don't know the index size of Google or Bing, for example, or Yandex or Baidu, for that matter. We don't know the freshness. There are tests that you can run. And we know, obviously, that uh, Google and Bing are pretty good when it comes to news and stuff like that. So they are picking those news up. But it's a different kind of 
indexing um, that we of course also do. So, but there is no there is no industry standard. There is nothing like that. It's basically everyone decides for itself what is appropriate when it comes to freshness of the information. One well, one of the things we do, and something you touched on there, was uh, ChatGPT, right? And it's we 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 have our, our own um, uh, generative AI called Wilson, and um, in terms of speed and updating that. Because we have our own data sets, we can do some some quite cool things. I don't know. Do you want to do you want to talk about that or it's quite cool? Sure, <laughs> it's quite cool. <laughs> up, up to y'all, if you want to talk about it, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. So, well, maybe yeah, I'll, I'll talk, let, let let you get into it. But um, uh, essentially, because we have our own index, we're and because of the the the, the way that Wilson is is modeled, we're going to be able to. Um, build that um, AI so that it's updated more frequently with fresh information from our index, uh, a lot faster than um, Chat GPT, for example. Uh, yeah, I'd love to explore that more if you want. But uh, just to give some more context, you know, with what you're trying to collect, the the web index you're trying to build within the own per parameters that you've set at Tempe, uh, how how big is this data? Like, if you package it all together, how like how much space? Are we, like, it. I mean, the the web is immense. You're talking about you know videos yeah. and photos and text, it's just an immense amount of data. Like, how much are you storing to house this data index? Yeah. So we we uh, so we store the text content, and um, if you talk about images, for example, when we talk about image search, we don't store the image itself. Because that would probably be even uh, copyright infringement. We can't, you know, you can't do that. But what we do is we store a, a, um, a, a thumbnail of this image, which is a very small version of it, obviously, and then all the information that allows us or that allows the user to search for this image. So, uh, and that's all text. So we can say, in average, um, a web page, so one web page. Um, is about seven kilobytes in size, so that's the rough the rough uh, uh, average that we have right now. Uh, and then you have a website, and then you have a lot of pages within this website, obviously. But it's it's about it's about seven kilobytes um, per um, um, per web page. And so we are looking, and when we know, for example, our Guardian network has a capacity of around. 600 um, terabytes so that's what we are looking at the moment so um, and it is planned to grow obviously so we are talking when we look into our plans when we you know once we reach the image uh, the image um, size and the web size of bing we are looking at around three petabytes um, so 3000 terabytes that we are having in, in capacity that's what we are looking at around it's quite a lot. I mean, we have the largest, and that's um, that's a very interesting part. Um, it's not not a secret what we use as a database backend. So we use a, a software called um, Apache Solar, um, and we have the largest deployment of Apache Solar already. So no one has ever done what we have done, and no one has ever tried it in a in a in a in such a decentralized fashion completely distributed around the world. And the funny part is, it's actually working. <laughs> so, you know, it's really amazing that not only what we have planned, remember, it, we are tapping into new territory. As I said, the database, for example, I mean, I have, um, over the months, we have talked to a lot of solar experts and stuff like that. When we talk about them, what we have in terms of deployment, um, they just, yeah, they haven't seen something like that. So there has no one has ever tested it, because you can't just you know you can't just start four hundred servers around the world to test your network deployment. It's just not important, uh, not possible. So we have with um, our Apex Two, for example, we have proven it's actually working, and it does actually work. And that's the first time that someone has tried that successfully even, uh, which is really amazing because we couldn't, we are not able to test what we are what we are doing right now. We can test it in a small scale, obviously, but we wouldn't be able to test it in its full um, large scale. So I'm um, I'm really amazed but uh, by the fact that 
what we have planned, what we have developed, um, actually works um, at scale as well. And that's really cool. And just to give some extra context here, I keep mentioning this thing, this Apex 2. And for those who aren't in the know, uh, this is a period happening right now where they're actually stress testing uh, this node network, which is doing the heavy lifting um, for their, uh, you know, for the to gather these these data sets and stuff. Uh, so, okay, we're talking about this data, and I, maybe you know one of the ways we talk about this is some of the the AI stuff, which I think is super cool. But um, you know, I feel like you can get lost in the weeds of all this and think, okay, Tempe data search engine and just write it off as, as that. And in, in my mind, and which you've kind of already said at the beginning, Gareth is, you know, Tempe is a data company. And in my mind, the search engine is a side effect of that. One of the many things you can use this data for, but it's by no means the main directive of uh, your company. Correct me if I'm wrong at any point here. So let's expand out and talk about this data. Like why gather it? Why is it so valuable? Uh, what are, you know, who are you hoping to uh, sell this data to or who's going to utilize it? Like, get, paint me a picture of of the data, if you would. So, yeah, the the, the data industry is a huge industry and it's, it's growing year on year. Um, there's, uh, you know, people now saying the, the data is more valuable, more valuable than gold. I don't know how they actually evaluate that. Um, but it, it's certainly a very valuable asset. Um, currently, the, the industry's uh, valued at around 500 billion, and that's set to grow to over a trillion in the next five years. And um, the, 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 the types of uh, organizations that are utilizing this data are, are, are many. You know, every industry needs data for uh, research purposes, whether it be for for uh, academic studies or um, market research. Um, developers use data to integrate into their applications that they're building. A really hot topic at the moment is is AI, and there is a big question around um, what data is uh, our AIs uh, trained on, and how can we trust that data? Where, how, where do we know where it's coming from? What, what does that mean for, you know, the end results of um, uh, AI, and how do we trust it? It all comes back down to to data. So certainly, the the AI is a big space where uh, people are crying out for uh, data that can be trusted and that doesn't cost the earth as well. And and those are things that we're we're addressing in terms of cost effectiveness, in terms of trustability of of that data. And if somebody was interested in in utilizing your data, are there do you as a company put restrictions on how they do that? Like how do you manage? Do you just give them the fire hose and turn it on? Like how do you how do you within your company regulate the data flow to other people? I mean, if you want the firehouse, you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, we have we have um, commercial models um, that allows us to uh, see what what uh, to, you know from a customer point of view to choose what type of data is it you want, how much do you want, and how often do you want it, and stuff like that. But it's basically we do not restrict it uh, in that matter. So we uh, we are more the opposite of that. We engage and we enable customers to basically also create their own format in terms of what what what's the structure of the data they need and we will provide this structure so um instead of forcing our structure upon the customers and the customers need to work around us we do it the other way around because we are sitting on the source so we can change the structure um, how we want to provide this information without with, with ease, basically. So we allow the customer to choose, okay, what type of data do you need? What type of structure do you need? Just create it and then you, you know, turn on the firehouse and <laughs> get plenty of information. And whether it's 100,000 records or it's 5 billion records, that's fine. Yeah, what what we have right now is is effectively the fire hose, right? So if people want data, we can, we can give you that fire hose, which, which basically comes through API access. And you can have access to the data, um, and we're we're in discussions with our first data customers at this at at this stage right now. Uh, going through, well, actually, you know, it, there's 
there's there are use cases around just having a stream of data but what we want to find is how do we structure that to uh, be more effective for use cases within specific industries and um you know those are the conversations and those are the um, use cases that we're working with customers on right now um if if there's anyone out there who's listening to this right now and you need data come to us talk to us and we'll be interested in talking to you about your data requirements because ultimately we're on this journey where we we we're, we're, we're uh building these data profiles so that they can in, instead of just being a, a fire hose um I, I love that analogy it's um providing uh real value straight off the bat effectively with moving in having structured data sets that are, uh, are ready to use for your industry specific use cases and then with these customers um like maybe uh if you can share, you know, if there are any customers you can share, but if you can't share that, maybe what are some of the business types that are, you know, currently uh, utilizing this? And maybe like even how many, you know, how many customers do you have? I know this is really early stage, so I imagine that, you know, the, the numbers will be different a year from now. But like, what is that? What is that landscape just for Tempe customer wise look like right now? So so right now we just have a, a handful of customers that we're talking to. As, as I said, it's uh, about building these use cases up right um and I, and I think we will be announcing some in a few weeks i can't re- mention it at the moment um what we want to do is really get that established and and they're actually helping us sort of package this offering up to be able to then go to market and say right we we just it's not just data the fire hose that you can have you know it's 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 structured in this ways for for your use case um but uh, and I touched on it earlier, specifically around AI. That's where we're getting most interest uh, at, at that at this stage in um, being able to have access to trusted data to to run AI, yeah, uh, to train AI models. I wanted to maybe, um, yeah. So basically, what we do have at the moment pilots that help us to bottle up um our our water source and maybe put some you know taste on it and some bubbles on it and tell us okay how do they taste or how what, what taste is it they like uh, and that's our pilots right now so we have then soon our bottle fit factory and then we can <laughs> do it on the large scale but that's, that's how we do it yes <laughs> i like that i love it, <laughs> I love it. So, uh, okay, let's talk a little about the AI angle then. Uh, I think that's an interesting one to, to chat about. Uh, maybe there's two ways we can discuss this. One, what are you currently doing with AI yourselves, with, with Wilson? Uh, what are you trying to build internally? And then the AI companies that are approaching you for this data, like what is, in, you know, what is maybe unique about how you're giving you know, the, this data or the data itself or, uh, or what's something that's interesting like in that conversation that you're having with them? I can take that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're the AI guy. Uh, Okay, am I? (laughs) So yes. So what is it we do? So with Wilson, with Wilson, we have our own large language model. Um, It's based on the pre-trained model. So and at this phase uh, where we are in development, we utilize the pre-trained model and um, specialize this pre-trained pre-trained model. Obviously, um, in uh, in the near future, we are planning to create our own uh, large language model. It will be a little bit different to what we are used to in terms of chat GPT and stuff like that because it's not really the right way to make the model bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger um, and to make it an all-rounder. I mean, it's good to showcase the um, capabilities of artificial intelligence today. It's really great, but it's not really practical when you actually want to solve a problem with AI. So large language models tend to have more issues than um, than they are worth actually utilizing for that. So it's better to specialize your models to have a role, a specialized role, and to have several models instead. And that's the route that we do, uh, that we take. We basically have um, 
several models that have a specialized role and they are really good at what they do and our platform is um, the one who combines all of these very transparently for the for the user so you won't even notice that we you have engaged with five different models it feels and looks like you have engaged with someone like chat gbt but in reality you haven't and that's the really important part um the development of something like ChatGPT um, or, you know, the um, other models that are very huge, it really restricts the market because there are only a handful of companies who can actually run something like that. Um, and there are only really a handful of companies who can train something like that. So instead of restricting... Um, you know the supply of large of really large models we go a different route and say why should we compete with someone we don't compete with chat gpt um we are basically looking into how can we combine different models to have the same result but these different models are really specialized in its in 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 its own um, um area and that makes it probably even um more accurate when it comes to data we have an unbiased index unbiased really means we do not um prioritize um for example our revenue over uh, the data so that means when we look into when you search something or when you when you um have a query for your data sets it's the pure query. It's always content driven. So that means you get the results that have most to do with what you are looking for. There's no on our side no um, no rebalancing of uh, of the um, 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 scores or anything like that, because we give you the pure information, the pure data. We also don't filter um, regions. We don't filter left or right or center or anything like that. It's basically you are searching for something. That is exactly what you get. We help you to find it, uh, to find more information by widening your scope. But we are not changing your search query. And that's very important. If you look into all the competitors that are centralized, they not only have a biased approach in their index, they actually change what you are looking for um, to something that they want you to look at. And it's, you know, it's not something I'm saying. It's something that has been proven many times. So there are so many, um, you know, reports about how we get manipulated uh, when we search for something. And AI is the same. If you base your AI, um, your large language model, on a data set that is biased, your AI will be biased. My AI will always be biased, but if the data set is already biased, it, there's no chance that it will see uh, a different approach or that it will see the different side. So I think it's important to have an AI model trained on the most unbiased information as possible um, to make it more accurate. I think if we, if you, you know, you can talk about it in terms of like objective and subjective, right? So essentially, like our data and the data we provide is objective. It has no agendas uh, behind it. Whereas if you have subjective data that perhaps is skewed towards political agendas, and then you train an AI on that subjective data, then you will get subjective results that are skewed towards those political agendas um so so really you know our, our unbias comes in the form of like having objective data that you know you're not being manipulated uh towards some other personal organizations cause and how do you maintain that lack of bias once upon a time rewind the clock google's slogan was don't be evil and here we are right like how how do you not become eroded to profits or you know whatever whatever influences could make you want to give a bias or whatever to the data sets i think i think the uh, this is again where blockchain is really useful uh because blockchain can provide a uh, a level of transparency in in what we're doing um <clears throat> now uh you know ultimately uh you know anyone can manipulate the data but what we're building is um a, a, 
a system where we can evidence through trans blockchain transparency and and the governance process around you know how are algorithms uh, making decisions and um how they should make decisions and ensure that they're in favor of community now this is extraordinarily complex piece of work that we're going through not not just building the data sets but actually how do we govern it how do we provide that transparency um and, and that's something that we are, are working through on how we actually evidence that as part of our uh, data manifesto that we're producing which uh, not only goes through about our standpoint on how we're providing that transparency uh th through through governance um but then also about uh what our policies are if you like around uh data that we won't show right so you know we always say we we don't manipulate the data right we we don't do it in a way that will have an end result of uh you know biased results um or subjective results but there are things that we can't show in search results legally we just can't do it so um but where is that line where's that that line right between what we can show and and where do we uh actually position that line to be the most unmanipulated objective data set in the world but not pushing it over the line so that we can't actually operate legally <laughs> um so it, it's a big piece of work which we're going through as i said we, we will be publishing a data manifesto um that 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 goes through all of this and our position on it um ultimately though when we launch the search engine to the public you will see the difference in results um and and one of the um features that we're going to be providing is actually comparisons to your google and your bing results so you search through tim p and you will see the results that you get and you can search through google and bing and you can see the results that uh, are there and what you do see and what we see already within our search engine um is that you know it's not skewed towards commercial partnerships such as amazon you search for products on google you'll get amazon and and other um, commercial partnerships who pay them tens of million dollars a year um with our search engine you you don't get that um unless it's really relevant you get the relevant results for what you're exactly looking at which aren't pushed towards any commercial um, biases great any thoughts on this one too jurg no i don't think i can add any it was really good <laughs> uh, yeah that was a great answer uh okay well how about this i would love uh to kind of shift gears now we've been talking about the data uh we've talked very minimally about like how you're collecting this data which is the the network the network of nodes uh, but i'd like to transition because we were talking about ai and Tell me, is this something that's unique to Tempe? Because um, I think it's a very no novel thing that, um, you know, in the future when you have your nodes that are more AI-oriented, um, which are those Synaptron nodes? Synaptron, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which will have actual GPU, um, uh, have GPUs on them. So you're not only going to be collecting data that you can use for large language models to um, operate AI from, but you'll also have the means for some AI compute within your network. And I feel like that's maybe a rarity in this space. I mean, talk to me about that. Yeah, it's maybe. Um, so what we need when, when you, when we talk about creating an, an index, um, of the internet, there's a lot of work that needs to, uh, be done, um, on the machine learning and AI base when you index this kind of information. And um, that's why we had to create your own AI node, basically, that is part of our network. And um, when we start with Wilson, let's give you an example. Wilson is one large language model that we run, and it runs on Synaptron. So it's part of our own network. And um, being part of our network enables us to control and to manage the number of AI nodes for, for a typical model, the, um, the location. So at the moment, when Synaptron, when a Synaptron node joins the network, our network knows where this node is in terms of um, latency away. 
and in what region it is. And then it will serve this region. And this might be that it runs a Wilson uh, a Wilson model. It might be that it runs an, an object detection model for images. It might be um, a word vector model. There are so many different AI models that we have to run. Uh, and it might only or it might run a, a customer um, Wilson version, so a custom Wilson version that is trained on your own information. So there are a lot of use cases where we can utilize Wilson, uh, sorry, Wilson, but also Synaptron. And um, we wanted, and that's the design, we wanted it to be able to run on consumer hardware as well as when you have a larger deployment, you can utilize it as well. So you can run it on a 2080 Ti, for example, no problem. It's not even you need the newest and you know the latest and greatest. You can run it on existing hardware that you have laying around anyways. You can run it on your Windows machine while you are working. And um, when you when you start gaming, for example, it will pause automatically so you don't have any um you know disadvantages on that one so but it's really important for us because we are a data company we do need a lot of ai and machine learning for sure and that's why we have added synaptron to our entire network so we can actually provide um this hardware that we need for that within our network and we we, we use ai pretty much everywhere right with the well search engine algorithms with wilson with you know image detection like we 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 run many many ai models in, internally um and so you know that that is you know at the uh in, in the first instance um the snapton network enables us to to do that and grow and expand and, and scale um but then also we have that network and then we can actually utilize it for some pretty interesting things like um uh, allowing your cell phone to run a Synaptron node and run uh, your customized version of Wilson that learns about you, learns about what um, your your interests are and what you're trading in and the, the topics you're following. And then um, we can train it to talk like you so that people can engage with this uh, Andy bot and it'll be able to respond like Andy, talk about the topics that you're following, that you're discussing. And that can all be run on your individual Synaptron node. Yeah, that's super cool. And, you know, I'm okay with it sounding like me, but in terms of the way it looks, it's going to be a partially deflated volleyball with a bloody handprint on the front. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that's my Wilson. That's Wilson. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I love... I love the flexibility that, you know, having these GPUs on some of your nodes on the network gives you. And it seems to me like if, you know, once you're able to uh, get Synaptron node licenses and run them, if you have a gaming computer at your house, like you should, you know, if you're in, into crypto and stuff, why not run that? And when you're not playing games, you're, you know, earning on the network. So that seems pretty, pretty great. So talk to me more broadly because uh, my channel, I talk a lot about nodes. I'm all about the passive income and the various things. Love the crypto nodes. Um, so more broadly, how do you, you know, you talked a little bit about this, but how do you utilize nodes across your entire network? Um, and then, you know, what's, what are the next like steps with the nodes look like? We just, you just had a, a launch of some nodes. They're currently stress testing. What's next? Yeah. So at the moment we, we are running our guardian networks, so our storage um, and we are stress testing the network um, from from a collecting point. So it's end to end, basically, from a, um, gathering the index and going the index. We, we are running the end to end test right now. And as I said earlier, this hasn't been done before. So um, we have already um, received and, and, you know, got got a lot of um, information that we can utilize to basically improve on on uh, on things. Um, so there are. Um, um, yeah, we are applying updates and stuff like that. So that's the phase where we are in right now, where we have our storage capacity, our collector network, everything is working um, in conjunction and working nicely together. The next phase is adding the Synaptron node to it. And Synaptron will then enable us um, to run AI models for different tasks, as we already discussed. So that's coming in the next have we announced it? <laughs> we haven't, we, have we? haven't announced the date. 
No. No, we haven't announced. Okay, it will come. Please stay tuned. <laughs> but it's 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 um, and then after that we have one additional node that we have in our roadmap, and that's the GeoCore that will be our last for um, the deployment. And then there might be later on um, different smaller uh, nodes, maybe. But that's we will see. But that's the Synaptron is next. GeoCore is um, um, the um, the one after that, and that's the network completion, and that's basically the community will run our network. And you talked about it. Um, and one thing that you that you asked earlier is how can we prevent from being uh, becoming evil? Well, our community runs our in infrastructure. If we becoming evil, our community can switch off our infrastructure, and that's it. Uh, we can't also, we can't be bored. So someone, you know, the big guys can't come around and say, we buy Timpy. Well, they, they could, in theory, buy Timpy, but in that moment, the community will flip the switch and that's it. Uh, so that's really a little bit, it, it's a security um, net that we have around not becoming evil, not being able to become evil, or not being bored by someone who makes us evil, or, you know, who's not following through with the message what Timpy is all about. The community, it's not only the governance process through the blockchain, but the community is also the power. Because if we don't have any supporters on the community side, um, well, then the network is dead. So that gives, gives I think, the community the insurance that we won't do anything stupid uh, or won't, you know, turn around and become evil because it's not, not what we want. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the things I love about play, Web3 yeah. and, and, and Deepin is that like extra, extra layer. And, and Gareth, I'll let you go in just one second. Uh, but before, I just want to say that uh, like uh, if the Sinatron launch is something you're interested in, you know, what's next? Don't worry. If you're watching me, you're watching my channel, as soon as these two gentlemen let me share dates and things, I will share it right on my channel immediately and get you uh, in the loop about when the next launch is. Hmm. And the, you know, I was going to say the the community clearly play a huge part in what what we're doing here, and you know, we'd like to encourage people to to look deeper and and get involved. Um, and and with that, I just want to sort of explain the the importance of these Apex events. So earlier on, you said, Andy, that yes, these are about you know stress testing the the the, the network, but it's about building the network out in in. Um, uh, consumable blocks, right? So we started with Apex One back in March time, I think it was, um, and that was focused around the collector and the the collector node collects the data from the internet um, and stress tested that, make sure that all works effectively. Um, and and then now with Apex Two, we've introduced that Guardian, where which is storing that information that the collectors are collecting. Again, stress testing that and pulling in to that together with the collector and Guardian operating next. It's an Aptron, which is the AI piece, and then pulling that together with the collector and Guardian, and then the Geo Core, which coordinates it all as well. So we're going through these uh, Apex events which are tied to the release of the uh, the, the nodes. Uh, node access is uh, controlled via um, access NFTs um, that you purchase, connect um, to the um, application on your computer, and, and away you go. It's a very simple process. So yeah, highly um, encourage people to, to look more, get involved, uh, understand what we're doing, and be part of these uh, Apex events that, that we're going through. And uh, one of the so at this as at the time of recording this, it's uh, it's September of 2024. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of speculation about 2025 and you know, this big crypto bull run and stuff. And I don't you know, my crystal ball stopped working a lo long time ago. I don't know what's actually going to happen. But if that is indeed uh, a bull run and everything is all this excitement, uh, Tempe right now is very small in terms of market capitalization, which is, you know, one of the, you know, aside from just loving everything you're building, I just love the opportunity here. Uh, but obviously that would also need to coincide, you know, big things happening, uh, you know, in terms of the success from a, uh, a, a viewpoint of like price and stuff, you also need to have things happening and being built within the company. So I'm, you know, broadly speaking, just over the next 
six to 12 months, what are some of those milestone like roadmap things that people can look for and see that you're talking about that are actually happening and get excited about? Walk me through some of that. Yeah. So so we're in a transition period right now where you know, people who are getting involved in Timpy, getting the nodes, buying the token, um, are, you know, we want to move away from that being less speculative into um, a, a real viable uh, to the value of that being backed by real viable products in the market. And so that's what we're focusing on right now. Moving into Q4 in the beginning of next year, we have the uh, release of the search engine. Uh, we're starting to build our customer base up for, for uh, data usage. Um, that's available right now. So again, if people need data, come to us, we have data. Um, so we're going to continue to build out and uh, our data customers and that proposition. Um, we're releasing a search engine. We've got dashboard release as well. Dashboard is probably another podcast that we can talk about. Um, and so we're focusing on those product releases so that we're in a position where we have real utility um, that's being provided uh, for the for the token. And we have real products that are out in the public and, and, and being used. So that, that's really an important stage for us. Um, and then also then moving into uh, a, a, a stable revenue position with those products being in the market. Uh, that all puts us in a very good position so that um, there's utility and volume coming through, not only for the bull run, but you know after it ends, what happens? Well projects that don't have any utility die uh, with our products being in the market we have real value and real utility uh there which should will see us uh you know through any bear markets and through to the future for 10 20 30 years yeah i think uh it what you just said there at the end is really interesting which i uh you know so far a lot of things in the world of crypto have not been immune to the cycles, but with the advent of this deep in Web3 world where you have some real world business applications that are happening uh, simultaneously with the kind of the, the crypto side of the business, um, I'm very curious. I'm very curious to see what the next couple cycles look like. Will we finally see, will it be Tempe? Will we finally see some companies that I won't, I won't dare say that are immune to the cycles of, of the market, but don't experience the same unbelievably dramatic, you know, 99.8% drops because there is real revenue, real business, real use cases built into it. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on, on, on that, Jurg? Yeah, I would say maybe not immune. That's for sure not, but maybe, <laughs> yeah, that's a, maybe I dare not. resilient, resilient. I think that's a like good that. word. Um, Yes, I mean, and with the model that we have, um, we are not just Web3, we are Web2 and Web3. We are still in the mix. We are, and that's one of our really, you know, um, things we, we, what we want, we want to achieve is the, the, the connection um, from Web2 to Web3 and also attracting more Web2 users into slowly and gradually into the Web3 space. So that's the whole thing what we are working on right now, what Gareth already mentioned, the, the dashboards. That's an area where we are a pure Web2 for um, the, the user who is Web2, but we are then also pure Web3 for the user who is Web3. So we are combining that. And it's very important when you look into being a search engine for this product and providing a dashboard and stuff like that, um, you can't just restrict yourself to purely Web3 because a search engine is not about crypto. A search engine is about finding information. So, and we are open to uh, and have the same um, functions um, for Web2 users as we have for Web3 users. And that makes us really resilient. Um, because if it goes down on one side, it won't go down on the other side in terms of um, um, being attractive to users, but also having revenue, ad revenue and stuff like that. So, yep, I would say we are uh, more resilient because we have more utility that is not just crypto bound or crypto related. Yeah, I love that. 
Uh, well, as just said here in the last couple minutes, uh, you know, we didn't fully dive into all the things of the search engine you're building. We've got the next nodes coming. There's all the stuff around AI and Wilson and Synaptron nodes coming. Uh, the dashboard. So, yes. There will be another podcast or multiple podcasts. There'll be uh, videos. And like I said previously, I will link to everything uh, down in the description so you can figure out how to get plugged in uh, to the Tempe ecosystem. Uh, but thank you both for uh, for joining me on this podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was always a pleasure, you know, talking to you. Yep, it's been good. Thank you, Andy. And to all those who listened in, thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next one.